church with our series on the Gospel of Mark. This is week 10, this is part 10 of this series. And we've been journeying through Mark, the Gospel of Mark, with this goal of hearing Mark on its own terms, which seems obvious but is actually really challenging to do because we have a lot of assumptions about the Bible when we step into a Bible study or a sermon. So we've been doing this work together through Mark over the last nine weeks. And this week and next week are our last two weeks because then we're heading into the season in the church year that's known as Advent, celebrating the coming of Jesus. It's, you know, we celebrate Christmas in the church from Christmas Day to January 5th. We celebrate Advent, the anticipation and the hope that Jesus is coming into the world, which means we're done with Mark soon. And for me, that has made preparing these sermons really hard because it's like saying goodbye to a friend that I'm not going to see for a while. I'm not, I love the whole Bible. I've really enjoyed our time together in Mark. And I've just been looking at these last few chapters over the last couple weeks going, man, like we only have a couple more shots at this. What are we going to talk about? There's too much, like we can't do it all. And as I've been praying about it and just looking at, man, what, Lord, what is it that you want to teach us today? Um, I actually ended up backing us up a chapter, back into chapter 13. This is a challenging chapter. I think it has really important wisdom for us today. I can't claim to understand everything about this chapter or that I will be able to answer, again, answer every question about this chapter. But I'm convinced that if we try to study it and hear it the way Mark is saying it, it will do something to us in a positive way and help to transform us into the image of Jesus. This work today is not gonna be easy. I may talk fast, and there may not be as many fun stories as a normal sermon. There's a lot to talk about in this chapter, and to not kind of go through it will leave you with even more questions, which is not a bad thing, um, but I don't wanna overwhelm anybody. It's uh, today. So the part we're actually gonna specifically read, even though we're gonna talk about the whole thing, is from the very beginning and the very end of the chapter, Mark chapter 13, verses one to eight, and then 32 through 37. I'm gonna read it aloud, it'll be on our screen in the NRSV translation. The word of the Lord for us today. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And then Jesus asked him, Did you, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. And jumping to the end of the chapter, starting with verse 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or the rooster's crow or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The word of the Lord for us today. Thanks be to God. You join me in prayer so we continue to work together and worship by studying the word. God, thank you that you speak to the situations that we experience in our lives. Thank you that your word is timeless and it has something to say to any season that we're going through. God, I pray in particular that you would fill your people that are gathered here and joining us online with grit, with peace, with patience, and with an open mind and an open heart to hear what Mark is trying to teach us about Jesus, who Jesus is, and what that means for us today. Give us your grace and abundance, Lord, that we could do this work together, we pray. Amen. So before we get into our text, I wanna talk a little bit about why 
why I think this passage is, is timely for us, why I think it, it's applicable. When I think about our world today, especially here in, in the West, because like, I, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, like the world's different in different parts of the world. Um, people think different, they have different culture, they have different assumptions about things. But here in the West, especially because of movies and like TV, we have this really romanticized version of life where there's like this super awesome thing happening at any given time and we all deserve true love and to be a king or a queen and have this amazing story. We see it in, on their TV screens all the time. We read it in the books we read. There's this idea that we are kind of the main character in the world and our lives. And we like to, not just us, but people in, the, in our world today, we, we kind of start to read into whatever's going on in our lives like there's some sort of secret meaning taking place behind the scenes. Listen to anyone tell a story about what's going on in their life. They're like, oh, you know, but that was important. It had to happen to make me the person I am today. And that's the kind of thing a character in a book could say because it's all, it's all a story, but we, we are storied people. We, we believe, and this is probably true, but we believe we're participating in some big story. There's meaning in everything going on. And as Christians, this is like especially true because we know we serve a good God who is sovereign and rules the world, and so we assume that everything that ever happens has some sort of meaning to it. And that's probably true, depending on what we mean when we say meaning. That's kind of our world, isn't it? We look around, we even look at ourselves, and we think we're, you know, we're pretty important. We're pretty special. And the things that happen must have some sort of heart to play in the, the beautiful fantasy story of our life. So that's true of our world today. It's true maybe of many of us. Also true of our world today is it's full of conflict. It's full of unrest and it's filled with uncertainty. There's war in Europe again, which for many of us, especially my age, to use that word again seems weird, but the human race has been here before. There's war in Europe again. There's economic shifts, upturns and downturns. There's different political circumstances. Many of us have medical issues or loved ones we care about who are having medical issues. Just to name a few, there's a lot of things going on in the world around us, conflict and unrest and uncertainty about the world and about our lives. And when we take those two things together that I think most of us would agree are true about the way our world views the world, that there's hidden meaning behind everything and also the world is a difficult place, the natural tendency is to assume there must be some meaning to the terrible, horrible, painful parts of the world today. There must be some big evil doer pulling the strings like a master of puppets. Otherwise, why would bad things happen in our beautiful, perfect, hallmark story of a world and life? When we put these two thoughts together, it can lead to us becoming callous to other groups of people in the world because we're all just actors on a stage. So the fact that there's real humans involved in these wars that we hear about, we can just keep them conceptual and just think about them as part of this big plot going on, and it's dramatic, and it's exciting, hence why news articles are so full of clickbait. You want to, like, oh, what, that happened? And you want to go read it. But this leads to us being callous toward other people because we don't see them as people. We see them as part of our story. And this can make us fearful about what will happen in the future because if the story is super important and there's all this hidden meaning, then what happens is really important, and there's a lot that could be at risk. And another thing that this can do, especially for those of us with the privilege to do so, this can make us want to hunker down and wait it out. Rather than looking to the needs of others, we could easily just focus on ourselves and hope that all that craziness in the news and around the world will one day fade away and that it, it must be important in playing some role in some big story that's going to end great for us even if it doesn't end great for everybody else. This is dangerous, though. And you can see it if you look at our, our world around us. This is dangerous because it can lead to idolatry in a really particular way. One of the mistakes that can be made when we believe those things I just said, that we're super important and there's hidden meaning everywhere, and 
we understand there's all these terrible things going on, is we can start to worship the details and the particulars of our culture, our family, our life, and our world. The things going on start to matter a lot. What we're seeing and reading and hearing matters a lot. And while we wouldn't want to use the word worship for it, it's very easy for us to worship these particular things rather than worshiping God. And this is troublesome because it can lead us also to believe that we are protected by God in some special way and that real Christians are never hurt, they're never sick, their houses never get hit by bombs. And so long as bad things never happen to us, that's a belief we can hold on to, right? But what happens when something bad does happen to us and our belief is built on we're the main character and God loves us especially much and nothing bad will happen because I'm the protagonist. I have to survive to the end of the show. What does this do to the way we view other people? The way we view our circumstances. Do we start to worship our life when it's safe and cozy as if, ah, God gave us this. Thank goodness that we are safe and cozy. And then when things break down, we assume we've sinned or something's gone wrong and that if we had done our part, life would always be very easy and comfortable for us. This is dangerous, church, because it's not really in touch with reality, is it? You don't gotta live very long to know that there's no one who's untouchable when it comes to grief and loss and pain. And even though we've had generations here where we live, where war has not come to our shores, look at human history. There's never been a country that's impervious to war, to destruction, to unrest, to famine. These things happen. And they don't just happen in history books. And they don't just happen to bad people. Luckily for us, as I describe all that tension that we experience, this is not new. It's not a new tension. And it's not a tension that the Bible fails to talk about. The Bible talks about this quite a lot. Actually, that's what the chapter we're going into today is all about. So as we've kind of been doing, I'll walk quickly through the story and then kind of backtrack to some of the key points that I think will be instructive for us. If you're reading in the NIV, um, our translators have done a disservice to you. The, the headers in the NIV are just terrible for this part. Um, that's where I got the title for this sermon, but they're not very helpful the NRSV breaks it down in a couple of different groupings, and that's the ones I'm going to use. This first section of the chapter that we read talks about the destruction of the temple. This whole chunk of Mark, Jesus has been talking about how the temple has become corrupt, is evil, and God has judged it and it will be destroyed. So this first chunk about you know, this thing happening and many coming to lead us astray, this is Jesus talking about the destruction of the temple. That's what his disciples asked. They're like, when is this going to happen? When is what going to happen? They're, they're asking, well, wait a minute. We just talked about this big, beautiful temple. And if you look up pictures, these stones are huge. They're like 40 tons. They're massive. They look at this amazing, impenetrable temple. It's indestructible. And they go, wait, Jesus, you think it's going to get destroyed? When? And Jesus talks about this. And then Jesus goes into this really important piece that we could easily skip over because it doesn't always apply to us. But he starts talking to them specifically about the persecution they're going to experience. And the persecution he mentions is specifically Jewish. He's using Jewish terms. He's talking about the Jewish leaders persecuting them for being Christian, them being drawn before the Sanhedrin in the courts. And, and he gives them some great advice about how they don't really need to worry about what they're going to say. The Holy Spirit's with them. And then we get this passage here that the NRSV titles, The Desolating Sacrilege. And if you don't know what that means, you are in good company there, are, there is so much disagreement on what that phrase means among pastors and scholars and Bible theologians. They debate about what that phrase means. All, all I know is that desolating sacrilege is probably what my stomach would call my decision to have Chipotle leftovers late last night. And if you don't think that joke is funny, um, I tried to run it by my wife, and she said she didn't want to hear another one of my jokes. So you got, it, you got it without any filter. Not skipping over that because it's unimportant, but skipping over it because we're not going to, in, in the time we have left, solve what's going on with that passage. But it is talking about something specific that the disciples would have understood. We know that. 
This is not some weird thing that the disciples didn't understand. They're very good at asking questions. They don't ask questions about that. So they must have known what that meant, even though we don't. So we can rest assured of that, that Jesus isn't just making weird stuff up. And then we hear this passage about the coming of the Son of Man. It reads, but in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the power in heaven will be shaken. It's this passage that gets quoted a lot when we talk about the end times. And this language here is pulling from the Old Testament. It sounds like creation itself is shaking, convulsing, and breaking apart. Like the light isn't working anymore, the sun's dark. Stars are falling from heaven. It's this like cataclysmic language, like the world's falling apart. It's crazy. The whole earth is shaking at the coming of Jesus. And then we get this reference to the fig tree, which is a story we skipped over, but the short version, this fig tree story is about Jesus condemning the temple. This has just happened, and Jesus comes back to it. And he says this other thing. He kind of spins it and lets them know to be alert. And then we get what we read here at the end. And Jesus asks his disciples to be watchful. And he gives them this parable of a master's gone off. And rather than just mess around and sleep and be lax, his workers, his servants, ought to be doing what they're supposed to do because they don't know when the master will come back. And why, a lot of stuff just happened. Why is Jesus saying this? Well, there's a couple of, a couple of reasons, a couple of things he's addressing. First of all, Jesus is aware that his disciples that he's talking to are like deeply formed by their own upbringing, their own culture. Like he's not pretending like, I don't think Jesus' eyes glaze over and he stares into the distance and like is expecting like Mark to write all this down. He's talking to people he loves in terms they can understand and he knows what their weaknesses are. One of them is that they're very distinctly formed by their culture and part of that is this message that they are God's chosen people, no matter what they do. This is a distorted version of that message we get from the Old Testament. The people of God in the Old Testament are defined by living as the people of God. But for the Jews in the first century, it was all about ethnicity and not being Roman. They, were, they had right to the land. No matter how cruel they were, how little they cared about what God did, it was their birthright. They were protected by God. And this is why, if you go look at the history around that time, the Jewish people revolted against Rome and died brutally again and again and again because they thought they couldn't lose. They were protected by God. They were incredibly special. And that it was worth doing evil violence to get what they wanted. This is the story Jesus' disciples had been raised with. If you watch, there's a show that, that's out right now that uh, kind of shows like a cool dramatic portrayal of the, of the gospel. It's called The Chosen. And in that show, Peter is characterized, and there's no evidence in the Bible that he's exactly like this. Again, it's, it's like a play. It's dramatic. But he's like a rebel ready to fight the Romans. I mean, in some episodes, he's like, Once we're, if we're not fighting Romans, then I'm just going to keep training. Like he, That is what these disciples thought was coming. They thought war with Rome was coming and Jesus would lead the way. All the Jewish people thought that. And because of that, they thought the temple was indestructible. The temple's God's house. What do you mean, Jesus, is going to get destroyed? This institution, this building is undestroyable. It's perfect. It's your home. One day soon, we're going to kick the Romans out. The temple's not going to be destroyed. So when Jesus says this is going to happen, their response is a really reasonable one. Their whole world's going to come crashing down. Their, their leader just said so. So they go, Jesus, when is this going to happen? So tell us what to look for. When is this going to happen? What are the signs that this will happen? And Jesus explains some things about this. The disciples are looking for signs. And Jesus goes into how the temple will fall, but the temple falling is not a sign. It's just a symbol of the broken world. And Jesus starts to teach his disciples and heal their misconceptions. Jesus comes outright and says, there will be no signs. There aren't any. That's not how this is going to work. He explains that war and violence is part of the reality of the world is very broken. 
people are very evil, they're very cruel, and they like to hurt each other. They refuse to follow God's way. So when Rome destroys Jerusalem, Jesus isn't saying it's inevitable because it's some sign. He's saying it's inevitable because when violent men choose to be violent men, violence happens. He says here, listen to the way he phrases it. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. This is going to take place. But the end is still to come. He's saying, when that happens, when your whole world comes crashing down and violent war blows up your temple, that's not the end. The end is still later. That is just the result of people choosing violence instead of God's will. And then he goes on to explain something that we often take as prophecy, but it, just listen to how obvious this is. I don't know that Jesus had to see the future to say this sentence. Nations will rise against nations. Kingdoms against kingdoms. Yeah, that's human history, isn't it? His disciples are reading all this meaning into these wars, and he's like, guys, these are people who hate each other, choosing to kill each other, much to the damage of the whole world. Stop looking for weird meaning there. This is not good. It's not what I want. The temple's gonna be destroyed for it. Then he describes earthquakes, which at the time that Mark was writing this, there was earthquakes happening all over the world. There were some major famines happening in the Roman world. These are things that are happening. This isn't prophecy of one day. This is what the disciples experienced before their life was over on this earth. They saw this happen. And then Jesus comes back to the idea of signs, but not in a positive way. He says that many will come in his name, saying that they're the Messiah. They will come and they will say that there are signs, and they'll try to lead people astray. False messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be alert, I've already told you everything. So Jesus is saying, listen man, I'm right here, I've told you everything. When someone comes later on and says they're seeing signs, they are a false messiah and they're going to lead you astray. You have everything you need to know. What are you doing looking for more teaching from someone else? And that helps us to see how these things that we think of as signs of a one-day end of times are Jesus describing what would happen in 70 AD, one of the most brutal portraits of total war in our human history, the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus tells his disciples not to bother themselves looking for signs. He even goes as far as to say about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the messengers in heaven or me, only the Father. So they feel this burden to understand when all these things would happen. And Jesus goes, guys, I'm not even worried about that. Have you seen what I've done all through Mark? Does it look like I'm worried about the end of time? Or does it look like I'm worried about my neighbor, the poor, the sick, and the outsider? The foreigner, the orphan, the widow. And rather than encourage them to get really good at finding signs, Jesus cares for them like a pastor and a friend. He gives them helpful advice for the hard parts of life. He instructs them to be watchful, to be aware that when these things happen and some leader gets up with a sword and says, we can't lose, we're God's chosen people, that they are not demanded to die alongside that false Messiah. They're called to care for the least of these this may be surprising to us. It's not surprising at all to the book of Mark. If you've read it, like this is, this is obvious. Jesus is not concerned with winning a war. He's concerned with people, especially the poor, the foreigner, the orphan, the widow, the outsiders, the dirty people, the ones we're not supposed to like. Jesus assures them that the temple's gonna be destroyed and that they shouldn't assume that God is dead or has lost because some human structure is gone. He prepares them for persecution. He says in that part about persecution that the Spirit will be with them, that they can endure to the end and be saved, and that the Spirit will give them the words to say. And then he reminds them with this part about watchfulness to do their duty. 
rather than turning away from who they're supposed to care for, he reminds them, by the way, guys, like a servant who's serving while their master's away, don't be lazy and wait for the master to come back. Go do what the master cares about. Take care of people. Love people. Welcome the outsider. Touch the impure. Care for the most vulnerable. And he gives us this promise that he will gather all the people of the earth. He gives his disciples this promise that rather than being afraid to trust that one day Jesus will gather them together again, that Jesus will, to the sound of the entire world convulsing and shaking, will gather his people. That's how Jesus addresses those challenges that the disciples are facing in their minds. But where does that meet us today? I think Jesus might say a very similar thing to us as his church. There are no signs. And to look for them, at least based on the way Mark, which is part of the Bible, in case you're frustrated with this, at least the way Mark is describing the words of Jesus, to look for them is to follow false messiahs. To claim we see them is to be false messiahs. It's to try and do something Jesus refused to do. And according to his words, he was incapable of doing. He, only the Father knows. And this frees us, church. We don't have to look for hidden meaning in terrible things going on in our lives. We can grieve them like God would have us. We can say, this is terrible. Children were killed by bombs this week somewhere in our world. And we don't have to pretend like, well, it's just the next part of the story. We can acknowledge that it's not right. And that being watchful means doing what we can to bring an end to that sort of thing. Even though we know one day Jesus will come again and bring an end to all of it. And this frees us to stop wasting time looking at how the Bible can tell us how much food we need to put in our bunker. And spend that time looking at how the Bible can shape us into people who are profoundly moved to love others. Church, we're free to do our job. To take up the family business. To stop Wasting time bickering on the internet about all these signs. We can go be the church. We don't got to give airtime to people that are trying to start an argument with you about what, what's going on in Europe. Let's love our neighbors. Let's love our children, our families, our spouses. We are not wasting our time when we focus on what God cares about. He doesn't seem too concerned with signs, whatever those would be. This is a great gift, church. We can be realistic about hurt this way. That's a gift we can give to the world. The church should be the best people on the planet at experiencing pain alongside others. Empathy should be our greatest strength. Because like I said at the beginning of our service, we serve a God who sees people. God sees us. He sees everyone. And he can empower us to see them. And that helps us put things into a healthy perspective. And that keeps us from saying things like God is causing all the terrible hurt and death in the world. There are churches that believe that. The Bible's not demanding that we do, at least not the way Mark is saying this right here. You can, you can go argue with Mark if you would like. I encourage you to do so. It's a hard chapter. You will find lots of people smarter than me who disagree on this with each other. Rather than pretending that Christians don't hurt, we can learn to hurt in front of others to give them hope. That God sees us, and because of that, we're so confident that we can hurt in public and that we are then able to see others. And we can live watchful lives. Because about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the messengers in heaven or the Son, only the Father. But we can keep alert. We can be about Jesus' business. And I know it feels like a long journey. There's so much hurt in the world. Wouldn't it be great if all that hurt could just come to an end today? But we don't know when our master's coming back. What we do know is the work God's given us to do. And we don't have to wait to do it. We don't have to live in a scarcity mindset that we don't have enough to store up for the incoming apocalypse and also love our neighbor. We can focus on loving our neighbor and trust that God is bigger than any of our needs. This frees us, church. This frees us to stop watching for signs and start watching for what Jesus wants. Rather than being asleep, which Jesus warns us about, rather than being asleep and neglecting our call, we can live our call. We can do this. 
We can devote our full attention to it. We can become awake. We can perform our duties. We can be joyfully awaiting the day Jesus comes while doing the work of Jesus today. This is not a hurry up and wait good news. This is not something that just means something one day. It means something for us today. The church is not a country club that waits to go to heaven. We're a called out people. We were called out by God to care about what God cares about. Watchfulness that Jesus demands is doing exactly what Jesus has been teaching us this whole time. Welcoming outsiders. Touching the impure. Caring for the most vulnerable. And we don't have to miss what Jesus is doing now because we're focused on what or when Jesus is going to do something in the future. We can devote our full attention to participating in the kingdom of God now. We have Jesus' permission to do that. When he describes the desecrating sacrilege and the terror there, what he tells them to do is be aware that this is going to hurt some of the most vulnerable people. He says, pray this doesn't happen in winter. Pray that, you know, this will be hard for pregnant women and nursing infants in that day because when bad times come, there's certain people that get hurt even more. Look out for them. Watch out for ways to participate in the kingdom of God. I think church leadership in the last hundred years has done us a disservice by trying to convince us to read signs instead of love our neighbor. We spent a lot of energy on that. When I was in high school, I know I did. I used to think about this a lot. What sort of creative solutions can we come up with to participate in the kingdom of God now when we reaffirm that according to Jesus, that's our main goal. That's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. Church, I'm convinced this is good news. It's not easy news. It would have been easier to skip this chapter, and I did, and I could have just not come back to it, but I'm convinced that a lot of us harbor anxiety about the things we read in our world today and the things we read Christian leaders saying about them. The good news of Jesus is that you can just buckle down and focus on your neighbor, focus on loving God and others well. When he said it's the greatest commandment, I think he meant it. Love the Lord your God with all you got and love your neighbor as yourself. So we're gonna pray before we are blessed and are sent back into the God's good world. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want us to dream for a moment. What could we do with that time? Rather than spending time searching the scriptures for little hints like it's the Da Vinci Code, what if we searched it for ways to be formed into the image of Christ? What if when we see things on the news or on Facebook or hear them from a friend or a relative or a leader, rather than being anxious about them, we'd be able to just be at peace with the fact that God is very good and that God intends to gather us one day and that God empowers us to do the work God has set out for us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you give us permission to do the work you've put in front of us. Some of us, God, have spent our whole life as Christians feeling less than because we were afraid of passages like this or the book of Revelation, as if the real Christians knew the day and the hour. Some of us have felt shame. Some of us maybe have even thought we knew when it would happen and we followed a leader who made some claim like that and then that day came and went. All those words describe some of us, God. I know that this truth describes all of us. That we need to be freed to do the work you've given us to do. Help us to be watchful this week. Help us to see our neighbors. Help us to have our imaginations reshaped around your goodness and your love. And when bad things happen, help us to immediately run toward the sound of the hurting and be with them whatever way we can. I think of that song that 
wells played for us, God. You are here with us. And one of the ways you want to be here with those who are hurting is by sending us, God. I pray you would empower us to live that way this week. Help us to continue to wrestle with this, to be shaped by it, to keep coming back to the scripture, knowing it will challenge us, but that it is good for us, we pray. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you've got time, um, since we're doing that Q&R today, we're going to bust down these two sections of chairs, stack them up, and bring some tables in. If you've got time, I'd love, uh, love the help in doing that. If not, no problem. We'll see you tonight. It's our habit to bless and be, to be blessed and sent back into the world. So I invite you to take a posture of receiving. Many of us, that's standing and putting our hands, palms up. That could be sitting with your head bowed low. That could be right up here. The altars are always open. They don't belong to me. Whatever posture you need today to receive this blessing as we're sent back into God's good world. Receive this blessing. Church, may we be on watch this week. May we watch for what Jesus is doing in and around us. May we see those that God brings into our path that we may love them well. May we be relieved from the anxiety and confusion of searching for signs. Freed to participate in the kingdom of God in the places we live, work, and play. Receive this blessing from 1 Thessalonians. Avoid every kind of evil. Now may the God of peace, God's self, cause you to be completely dedicated to God. May your spirit, soul, and body be kept intact and blameless at our Lord Jesus Christ's coming. The one who is calling you is faithful and will do this. Go in peace.